Belta de declares bankruptcy. We, wound up, we never did it. I mean, there were a whole bunch of other reasons why we never even put the RFP out, but including the fact that you know it was, it was such a custom-made building that other than Delta, nobody else would. But you imagine you do a build a suit, you spend $500 a square foot, it's a reservation center. Delta goes to bankruptcy and says, you know what? We got to rationalize. We don't need a, you know, we don't need a reservation center in South Florida. Who do you rent that to? What's RFP stand for? Request for okay. proposal. Okay, you want copies of all the leases and all the amendments there too. You want the rent roll. You want, the, and you want the, you want the seller to represent the rent roll. The rent roll is that legal document that summarizes all the, all the leases. Okay, you want to abstract the leases. I mentioned that already. So the abstract. I used to do this in the diligence class. I would give everybody in the class a, a lease, and I'd give them a form that I had. And that was their, that was their, their take home assignment for the week. Abstract the lease, you know, read it, look at the terms, conditions, the bumps, and all that, so that you understand, okay? And then compare the abstracts to Argus, because Argus is going to give you the financial information that you're going to model from. That you're ultimately going to go to the IRR and the cap rate. When you say abstracted, you're saying you can have a 200 unit building, but you're going to take the average rent or the average. Right. Abstract and like is where you take like a, a lease, that's what I wrote before, you're going to take a lease and you're going to summarize the salient terms and conditions on the lease on what's called an abstract. But how, I guess what I'm asking is how granular does that abstract so get and how, like, like broad level versus low level? Dude, you just break it down and make sure you, you know what it's, what all the covenants are in the lease. project that was bought and ultimately sold and this was an abstract that was put together by one of the presenters um, um, last well he wasn't one of the presenters but he was one of the guys that was in attendance the other day so um, if you take a look he's got a different tab well look at that he actually color codes them and all that stuff at the bottom can you make it bigger and and so uh, look at you know all, all the information that's there but ultimately I mean, I care about that. Can you zoom it in? Yeah, no, I can zoom it in. Get glasses, no. Get binoculars. Okay? <laughs> this is the income stream, okay? This is the income stream. Okay? So, and so, he's got the original lease, modification one, modification two, modification three, modification four. Okay? Modification five. Modification six. Modification seven, okay? And he highlights in red what's been changed from lease to lease. So, you know, that's what it looks like, okay? Now that's his form, but you're gonna get something similar from a law firm if you hire them to do that. Is that seven units or is that just like seven variations? Same lease? That was seven amendments to one lease on a multi-tenant office building. So like sequentially, you know, it started there and then after, you know, a certain amount of time, like a month or two went by, this is the new one. Or it was like, like, no. So what happens is, is like, uh, well, because I, I didn't know that kind of, the one after was actually uh, Ana Yegas is an architect who was one of my high school classmates. She moves into a building, she grows, she needs more space. She goes to the management office. I have a, a partner now. Uh, I need to amend the lease. Oh, we can put you in suite whatever. You sign amendment number one. Now you get another employee. Now you get more. Oh, I can knock a hole in the door. Amendment number two, and so on, okay? And so, amendments are like leases. They're contracts, they're just amendments, they're legal contracts that attach to a contract. Addendum, 
Okay. Um, you want to you want to you want to get involved in all the leases that are out. You don't want leases that are approved during the diligence period that you're going to have to walk into and you don't know anything about. So any proposals that are out on the street, okay, you want to take a look at. Okay, on, on that whole Under Armour thing that I talked about earlier, which was they sent stuff out at the end of the quarter. You know, one of, we we did cutoff testing as auditors. When I was an auditor, we we looked at cutoff. The, the period ends. This is a cutoff type procedure, right? You're selling. I don't want to walk into a transaction that you did that I don't know anything about it that I didn't approve. Okay, so that also becomes a, a point of conversation in negotiating between a seller and a buyer. Okay, you want the estoppels? We talked about estoppels. The posits. We typically don't don't worry so much about the posits in commercial leases. But there are deposits. Some tenants pay deposits. The smaller the building, the smaller the tenant, the more deposits are common. It's very common in residential, less common in the other asset classes, okay? But we need to understand that because we need to keep track of that. We need to get that from the seller, and we need to get the funds from the seller. We need to account for that in the closing, and then we need to, um, we need to, um, uh, uh, be able to you know be responsible or accountable for, accountable for that for the tenants. I think when we went over that in the last term, I think John, you were the one that made me aware of the fact that tenant deposits, even on commercial leases, needed to be escrowed, which is something that I've never seen in practice. And you were like, he was adamant. He went and did the research, and he came back and showed me. And in the statutes, it says even in commercial transactions, most landlords do not escrow deposits, but they're legally bound to do so in the state of Florida. Um, a market analysis we did already. We want a macro review. We looked at the key vacancy, absorption, rates, okay, and uh, 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 properties coming online, okay, from the sales perspective. So that's on, on the, the lease income stream side. On the sales side, we want to look at comps, right? We want to look at cap rates. We want to try prices per door. We want doors per key. To the extent that you uh, you'll eventually need an appraisal because you're going to need to get financing and a lender's going to require an appraisal. But, you know, you can do the appraisal yourself, really, okay? Um, we talked about the third-party report, okay? It's critical to rely on an expert. You want to take a look at roof. So you look at the envelope. You want the roof. You want the structure. You want the glazing, okay? You want the whole HVAC. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. <laughs> no, no. I, and the MEP or MPE, whichever way it goes, okay? All right? You want to look at sub-level. You want to look at at, uh, at the property and anything in the periphery. Okay? Because there might be stuff leaching from, you may be clean, but there was a printing company next door and it used to throw all their chemicals out the back. Um, we talked about a phase two. Um, you want to take a look at as builds. You want to look at plans. As, want, what are as builds? I got to understand as built. Okay, like, an architect, you want to tell what as built? When the drawings are generated, once the building's already done. So Is once the, the building's done, draft? you go in and remeasure everything and draw it up. So, so the architects will do plans, but then once the building is built. Gotcha, that makes sense. Okay, and, and in any. So, so this asset that I, that, I, that I told you that I ran that we sold. Had been built in like I don't know, like 1970 something, and it was a million square feet, and the as built were from like 1970 something, but nothing inside had anything to do because they had their own crew, and and we did all the build outs and you know without any permits. So I mean I didn't say I just did that. I can you turn that damn thing up? I didn't say no, but for for 30 years everything inside this place had been done without permits. And without any plans. So, you know, we bought it that way and we sold it that way. That's what happens when you live in Hialeah. No. Okay. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, that's the problem with small assets. Yes, Kenny. So, architects, how, how often is the as built different from the actual sketches that you do? A lot of times, because <laughs> while you're constructing the building, it changes from your drawings. Yeah. So how big of a difference are they? Like twenty percent, thirty percent? I don't know the percentage, but yeah. it's a, it's small. I mean, it shouldn't deviate much from the drawings. Yeah. So th there's a couple of different issues here. I think one there's an issue regarding management of the asset. So 
as you put in maintenance plans or programs in and you got to look at plumbing or piping or you know electrical you want to make sure that that's right and to the extent that what was drawn is different than what the physical conditions let you build you want to know that I'm the accountant I care about leasing square footage right I'm with you. and so what a lot of people do is is they will come in when they buy a building and they'll actually remeasure it because they want to make sure that in fact you're leasing what you're able to lease okay and you're accounting for all of the space that, need, that can be built okay and there's people out there that specialize in doing that and the ASPO no. and the ASPO or just no measure? they'll measure separate from the ASPO this will be a separate state you can do a laser scan and they'll give you all the measurements okay I, I, I'm not I just know there's people that do this out there I you know I did a big renovation of the polo club and there was walls without rebar without rebar yep it's not Florida Spec. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to Hello, Hurricanes. take them down and rebuild. Uh, we talked about parking already. When we talk about operations, you want to meet the property manager and you want to meet the employees, okay? Uh, a, a lot of times what happens in, is employees are good. And you may not want the management company, but the employees are good. They know your tenants. They know the operations. They, 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 he's a great engineer. He knows how to fix all the problems there. So a lot of times what happens is employees stay and so they'll, they'll leave the employee of one management company and they'll go to another one. But you want to interview these people. You want to take a look at all the operating, um, um, all the permits that are required for you know, the uses that are there. You want to take a look at all the service contracts and you want to take a look at expenses and you want to contrast. So I'll show you. You want to contrast exp expenses against what you think you can do. So you want to benchmark. What do my other assets look like? What appears in the industry look like, right? Go out there and get BOMA information if it, you're, it's a new market for you, you know? Maybe um, there's different um, uh, uh, metrics in different markets. Um, you want to take a look at operating history of the asset. What maintenance has been done on heavy and on the equipment, right? What deferred maintenance might there be there? You know, have, have these people come in and service the, the, the HVAC every, you know, every month? You know, they they you know done whatever needs to get done to the you know cooling tower every month or every year or whatever okay um, you want to look at camp statements if they've been building properly if they've been collecting properly okay you want to take a look at the budget and you want to take a look at insurance you want to take a look at um, utilities and any other any other expense associated for impact and for ability to save okay and ability to model Right? CAM stands for what again? Common, Common area, area maintenance. Thank you. So, so you've got you've got a building. Uh, this is kind of this yeah. kind of a cross section yeah. of a floor, yeah. like mm -hmm. so. If you have like a lobby, if you have a pool in your common area. You're right, but if it's like a lobby oh. and office building. Like well, or got paper or in the bathrooms. Your corridor. Yeah. So. There's a tenant here, there's a tenant here, there's a tenant here, a tenant here, and a tenant here, but there's a bathroom that they all share, and there's this common space that they share. So they're going to pay a pro rata share of the common space that they, a pro rata share of the expenses associating with maintaining the common space in the facility. Is that typically done on like a speculative basis, like they paid up front, or once the fees like hit it, they have to pay for a deep cleaner or like a plumbing you, say? Your, your lease will dictate how you pay it and when you pay it, but typically you're paying a percentage, okay, that's calculated based on the as bill throughout some study that's done that says you're gonna pay X percent of the common area expenses, and once a year, you're gonna get an assessment from the owner. Now, we used to, once we had the big portfolio, what we used to do is, is we, we would only true up with our tenants once a year because that's what um, our leases allowed us to do. But internally, every quarter, we would adjust our records. If we knew that we were billing more, so we, we have to recognize income every month. We're a public company. We had to recognize income. So we were recognizing that reimbursement. So the expenses we were paying, we were recognizing that reimbursement on a pro rata basis. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that, you know, in fact, we're, you know, we're recognizing based on what actuals were every quarter, so we Correct. would just adjust that. So, gotcha. okay, um, legal. So we want to we want to negotiate a purchase sale agreement. What's the sequence when you buy? What's the sequence when you buy? LOI. Okay, so let's let's go a little bit. Somebody, 
somebody puts marketing material together. Somebody decides they want to sell, they hire an investment sales guy, they put marketing material together. That marketing material gets circulated. Typically, in today's environment, these guys will have already set up a data room. They'll have leases, and they'll ha likely have all of these studies. They'll have copies of all the, you know. A data room? That's a committed seller right there. What's a data room? That's in, in institutional sales. That's yeah. You're not going to find that in a 31 unit yeah, deal you're market. looking at. Yeah. But if you're looking at teachers selling a 240 unit, you know, thing they've got on Lauderdale Beach, it's all set up. What's a data room? A data room is where you go to look at data. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, a silly question. You got a silly answer. All right. Uh, so historically, a data room was a, a, a center where a seller would put all the pertinent information so that a buyer could come in and inspect it. Does that change it, with the digital? Yeah, it has. So what happened, but historically, it was something that was done off-site because not so much in the context of a building, but if you think in the context of a business, you don't want employees seeing people coming and going because it creates uncertainty. So typically, it set up the data room off-site. Okay? Now, yeah, all the data rooms now are digital. So you scan all of these records and you put them up and you make them available you know, to people. Okay, so you'll have all this stuff set up, all the information. 90% of your diligence can be done digitally without even going and inspecting the site. Now, you need to go and look at the site. You've got to kick the tires, okay? Um, so um, from when they start sending these flyers out, noticing the sale, you might have... There might be a 30 to 45 day period, I'm going to tell you in today's environment, okay, from when they start circulating this to a call for offers. Okay, so this is day one here. They start circulating this thing. 30 to 45 days, so 30 days. So here I already started to say, hey, call for offers is so and so date. And you start getting a bunch of more emails here. Hey, call for offers in two days. Call for offers at midnight, okay? So then, that's when you submit your offer, your letter of intent, okay? You put your terms and conditions. A lot of times now, you even get, you even get a, a PSA. You get a purchase sale agreement that the seller said, this is a purchase sale agreement that I'm gonna use. So you tell me if you've got any objections to it. Okay, so they're already telling you that. Do people not submit before that call? Like if they're telling them, hey, you have 24 hours, wouldn't it look good if you did it early and show that you're committed? You know? Like everyone just sits back and waits? Like nobody has a sense of urgency? That seems wild in a you know, competitive marketplace. No, because... because you have a review figure. Right. Because once you get this, I told you guys the metrics. Today you might, you know, 20 people may have looked at it. You're going to get about 15 offers. And... They're still not going to throw people out. Now they're going to say to about 10 of those guys, they're going to call five of those guys and say, listen, thank you very much. The 10 guys are going to get, oh, we want your best, best and final. So about five to 10 days later, they're going to say, we want your best and final. And a broker's going to call you and tell you, oh, you're really... You're close, we'd like to give it to you, but you gotta push a little bit more. Can I answer any more questions? Did you consider this? Did you consider that? Did you consider the replacement cost? Did you consider that you could bump rents up? You know, did you consider there's no new product coming online? But they won't tell you how much to push, they'll just tell you to push. That's all relationship driven, man. That's right. I mean, you know, they're going to direct the people that they want to buy the building. Right, to make the sale. relationship, yeah. you know? So then, once the best and final come in, then there's going to be like, in three to five days, they're going to call the top three guys, which may not be the highest offer. Because when you submit your offer, they might say, and give us your markup of the PSA. And then you're going to say, oh, I want to, I want to see representations on all this stuff. Seller goes, okay, they got the best price, but I'm not making any rep representations. What does that mean, representations? We're going to get to that in a second. Stand by. How, when does the deal become it institutional? Is. Meaning, if you're collecting 500000 you I mean, that's... Collecting 500, um, you know, I mean, I, I would tell you there's a size component to it. Yeah, of course. I guess. So, so, you know, I mean... 
it depends on the asset class, but you're not going to see a lot of institutional great deals that are, say, like multi so. le le less than $10 million. Uh, you're not going to see anything that's class B or less institutional. Okay. You might see B, you might see B plus. You're going to see, you know, B minus, C type product. It's not going to be institutional. So, you know, multifamily in Florida, you know, I don't know, 150,000 bucks a door. Um, you know, uh, 150, 200 units. Yeah. You know, you're at 20, 25 million bucks. That's institutional. And who's buying it? Institutions. Okay? So, um, so now, now you got best and final. Now, they, now you got an interview. Now they want to know if you can close. Can you close? Can you close? Do what, what's your source of funds? Yeah, do you have to prove that? Like, you can already have like a proof pre, funds. yeah, proof of, of a mortgage. Like, or what, proof like, of, proof of funds. okay. I'm not, I don't want to, I was going to revert to being a coach again. I'm not, I'm trying to be professional. I was going to say, of course, they're going to want to know how professional do you sound? You know, this friend of mine that's buying this building in, in South of Louisville, I mean, I'm having lunch with him a few weeks ago, and he's like, yeah, well, I, got, I got invited to the call, and I'm thinking, this guy's going to sound like a buffoon. I mean, he, you know, he didn't know the right terminology. You know, he's a neophyte. And on top of that, he's like, what's your source of funds? Oh, I'm going to get together a bunch of guys. <laughs> he somehow got the deal locked up, so I, you know, now he doesn't have any money. I don't know how he's going to do it, but um, so anyway. Um, so... So here's where we're at, okay? Uh, so, so now they can say, Chase, you convinced me. You sound like a neophyte. I don't even know what that word is. What is a yeah, neophyte? Yeah, yeah. Neophyte? You're a newbie. You're a newbie. Yeah. You're a, newbie. Yeah. a novice. You're a newbie. A newbie. Rookie. A rookie. A neophyte. That was a really neophyte question to ask. H-Y-T neophyte. I didn't call it a dirty word. So you're a neophyte, but you know what? You've convinced me that you got this you know, inheritance and you're going to spend it all on this. So you know what? I'm going to give you the deal. So now things are going to move really, really quickly. You're going to have five to ten days because you've already agreed you're going to have five to ten days to sign the PSA. Okay? And there you're going to put, and there you're going to put your earnest money. Not big. I don't know, $20 million deal. You might have to put... You might, you know, you might have to put half a million bucks in. So earnest money is similar to like a security deposit almost? Well, no, like, it's earnest money. It's, 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 it's yeah, because it, it's a $25 million deal, like 100,000 bucks. I mean, even he can come up with 100,000 bucks. I want to make sure there's some substance there. So what's going to happen is, is you're going to have five or ten days to do this. And then probably pretty much at that point, you're going to put in half a million bucks, okay? And then you might have 10 days to go hard. On your due diligence, right? You've probably done diligence up to here. Here you just want to lock in your financing and make sure that everything's crossed. Are you doing any hiring or the, the data center will give you everything, pretty much? Well, you, you're, you're talking back and forth. You know, you're asking for additional info. And typically what happens is you'll get emails from the broker saying, or from the data room saying, hey, additional documents have been posted. Okay. okay, you might say, listen, we've put this additional, so-and-so requested this info, well, we think it'd be good for everybody to have. Boom, here you go. Okay, now you're going to go hard. Now that means two things are going to happen. Your 500000 is now at risk, and I'm going to ask you for another, a $25 million deal, I'm going to ask you for another half, half a million bucks. After that 10-day period? Yeah. So two uh, things happen. You, well, you got to put more in, and this yeah, becomes, and now this is loss. You, you still out. back out after you put the first You can back out, but you've just lost a million bucks. Yeah. Well, I don't understand earnest money. You back out before the second earnest. Yeah. Well, typically you can because that's going to come in the day you go hard. Okay. So the day you're going to go hard, you say, eh, I want my, I want my money back. So you basically you do your due diligence, you put in, a, you agree on a 
price you put in a deposit, you have another 10 days of due diligence, like, oh, like yeah. but Finishing you still back out if something pops up, but after that, you're in. You're in. You're in. You're hard. They can't raise the price. No, no, now you got to sign a contract already. You already signed the contract, the PSA or the APA, okay? Wait, so I thought there were markups there, and then after that you signed them. Well, so so one of the things that's happening now is people are asking for the markups there. Okay. So that's why you're giving yourself five to ten days to get this signed to incorporate whatever you agreed to accept. So the I, I guess I'm not understanding. So the half a million dollars. One of them is called earnest money, but the other half million is called hard money. What's the difference? No, I didn't, I didn't right? call it hard money. The hard money is something hard. that people... Going hard means you can't get it back. Going hard means you can't get it back. Okay. Exactly. You put earnest money. This is earnest money too. But what does that mean? You're being earnest. It's, it's just like it, and you're showing your, your fidelity, your, your commitment to close. Okay. You're being earnest. The importance of being earnest. Right, Isabel? Yes, sir. Yes. Basically, I'm not. Come on, Isabel. Can you get back the earnest before you go hard? You can. Before you go hard. Yes. So, so after you put the earnest money, you sign a PSA. Now, listen, listen. This is all negotiable. This might be a little bit different in real life. Okay. There might be other time Guys, listen. There, there may be other time frames involved with this. Guys, listen. This is all negotiable. I'm not telling you this the way it has to be. I'm just giving you a very common hypothetical example. You might have more time frame involved with this. You might have, on land that's for development, you might have 18 months to get entitlement. Okay? So, it, it all, it's whatever's negotiated between buyer and seller. But there will come a time in which your earnest money will be non-refundable. Okay? Well, no, not after due diligence, because if it's a development deal and you've got 18 months to get entitlements, it's after the entitlements, or eight, up to 18 months or when entitlements are given. Once entitlements are given, you you got to pony up more or go home. Or pay for an extension. No, that... In the context of an income producing property here, you're likely not going to, you're not going to, if you're, you're going to ask longer. for an extension, you're not going to get to this guy. You're not going to be one of the three guys. you got to close. Look, there's, let me finish. There's, a, there's the guy that runs a, the real estate program at FAU, used to teach at FIU. Isabel, you know him? Dr. Jobs? I, I, I know Peter Hen. <laughs> Ken Johnson and Bill Harden, who runs a program at FIU, wrote an article in one of these journals that nobody reads some years ago, and it said that, it said that uh, well, it said that institutional institutional you know, investment sales brokers added no value to a transaction. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I said I thought, well, I didn't have to do a study to know that. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I have to publish an article in a magazine. The reality is, is there is a value that they add, which is an intermediation value. They don't really jack up prices because the premise behind all this is that at that level, buyers and sellers know more than the brokers know. And it talks to a very tight-knit community. And so if you work at AEW or you work at Teachers or you work at Prudential or MetLife or Northwestern, you're not going to get a good deal and come out here and start asking them to pay for extensions. They're either going to give it to you because as a seller they haven't delivered what they wanted or there's going to be an expectation that you deliver. Because it's, it's all reputational driven. I mean, that, the Dania point, like his, his development had extension after extension after extension. Because of entitlement. Yeah. Well, but now you've got a situation where you've got a seller that wants to sell the land, right? And he's got somebody on the hook that's put a lot of you know effort into it. Okay, so I'm I'm thinking an institutional yeah. income deal as opposed to a land development deal, which has a lot of other moving pieces, right? And may have some seller involvement in those pieces too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so anyway, but there will come a day in which your original deposit and your subsequent deposit will be non-refundable.
from that point forward. So if you don't close, okay, uh, I don't know that you could do, you can force, what's it called, specific performance in real estate. You cannot force someone to sell. I'm sorry, you can't force someone to buy. So if you walk away, you walk away, you lose your deposit. I can't force you to buy it from me. I can't force specific performance. You can do it the other way. So that's a law. Can you do it the other way? I think you can, but it'd be probably cumbersome to do that, right? right. I think you can, but it's cumbersome. Yeah, you could just, and, or you could just put like a lien so that they have to sell them. Like, you don't, I don't think I don't you've know got lien rights. I don't know institutional. I don't know. I don't think you've got lien rights as a buyer. Yeah. John? It's called a like, notice of interest. Like, you put a notice of interest, and a, like residential, if they don't, if they decide not to come to closing or something. Okay, I don't know anything about residential. Okay. That's like a whole other world that has a whole bunch of other rights. Yeah. That that you know transcend what we do, okay? Um, and so then from here you, you might have only another thirty days to close. Yes, from home. Back to back up. The data uh, information, right? No era. Where you look at that is like a performer. There will be a pro forma in here. They will send you an Argus run. They will give you their version of an Argus run, okay, yeah. and, um, and 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 that you know you'll be able to derive an IRR from. But a lot of times, a lot of times it's happening now. So the seller is also including some sort of uh, um, not promise, but potential financing commitment, so that. Up to a certain L, um, loan to value, and at certain indicative pricing, to the point where they can, in the Argus run, already kind of give you what an IRR is going to look like based on the capital structure they think you can get. Okay. Now, but your job is to diligence that. Yeah. Your job is to look at what they have, and and see it for yourself. Yeah, the reason I ask that is uh, worked with and even for uh, a lot of people. Right. Yeah. No, you can. That's that's what you're. That's what that's that's the stuff you're looking at. So, for example, I mean, I didn't focus a lot on that, uh, but but when you take a look at when you take a look at um, it was in a previous one. When you take a look at operations, one of the things I sort of just jumped over is you you want to look at historical financial statements, and in a lot of cases where you've got small business owners, you're going to want to look at tax returns. And you're going to want to look at personal financial firm because a lot of times sellers cannot substantiate the cash flow that they're representing. And I would tell you, if I don't, if I don't see it on a tax return, I don't buy it in a small business <laughs> because what that tells me is is unscrupulous practices. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I can believe you. Right. And just like the integrity of the deal is. Out we the had a, we had a student in a program who who um, worked. Some of you may know him. I think he he uh, he collected rents for his dad. You know, and it was sort of like all low income stuff, and it was like it was all like a lot of cash type stuff. So I mean, that sort of business lends itself to money disappearing. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We didn't like what a lot of our things. And appearing. Yeah, but that, that, but then, <laughs> but then, I, you know, I just I just get old enough where you know, I just stay away from stuff like that. I mean, and then you might say, look, it's the only way I can get into a business is to get something like that. But then you're running a huge risk, which is how do you substantiate, how do you substantiate that that is, in fact, you know, the cash flow that's coming from there. There's no written lease in place. There's no cash coming in, but you're yeah. telling me you collected it. There's no transaction data. So if a tree fell in the forest and nobody heard it, did it, did it make any sound? It no. <laughs> he spent it, right? He spent this out of you. So, anyway. Um, Cole, did you have a question? I uh, not. Okay, so. Um, um, so when we look at the legal review, I included, and I think in the legal class, you guys go over, you know, title and survey and all, so I'm not going to go into that. Zoning, land use, okay? You want somebody to tell you whether it's in-house 
or an external party to tell you uh, what you can have there and if there's compliance. You want to take a look at you know tax compliance as well. Uh, you want to take a look at any kind of legal notice. I mean, you, you want the seller to give you any legal notice that they've received, any communication that they've received, right? So at the end of the day, Juliana, you want to know, right, uh, what's come from, uh, you know, any attorney or, or, or uh, insurance company uh, regarding any, th or regulatory authority regarding any, any uh, uh, threatened litigation, pending litigation, condemnation, you know, notice of action, anything related with that building, okay? Um, and um, and you ultimately are going to want to um, backstop that. That's where I was going to jump on. Is, and you're ultimately going to want to backstop that somehow to representations from the seller. Okay, so to your point, they're giving it. I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the, you know, to the contract. They're giving you a series of information. They're making certain verbal representations to you. The question's going to be in the contract, which is the only legally binding document that you have. What are they representing to you? What are they standing behind? And in most institutional transactions in this country, people are going to say, "We make no representations whatsoever." You've had time. We've given you everything that we have. But they will not represent that they have that they've given you everything that they have. They, they're going to represent that they've given you everything that they know that they have, or they've given you this. You need to determine the adequacy of that for your investigation. You've had enough time and resources to do it, and you've undertaken this decision on your own. You, on the other hand, are going to want you know from them, you know, things like you know definitively that there's no you know environmental problems there. You want to know definitively from them that there's no action from any regulatory authority. There's no legal action that's been threatened, you know, or has been served upon you, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So somewhere in between there, you're going to try to, you know, settle. In most institutional transactions, because you've got institutions as owners, no one person is going to make those representations. So you're going to have to live with um, typically only um, these carve-out provisions, these bad boy provisions. Provisions that ultimately talk to purposeful or willful misleading of a buyer. Anything other than that is pretty much going to be on the buyer. Okay? Buyer beware. You've kicked the tires. We've given you everything that we... We've given you everything that is here. I'm not representing if that's everything. We've given you all of this, and you're walking into this with your eyes wide open. So there's no... I know it sounds weird, but like just, you know there's like a lemon law for cars? It doesn't exist for like houses in any way? Like if you I'm knowingly... You're talking about houses, and I, I'm not talking about houses. Uh, well, okay, you're right, properties, I should say. So, and, but like if, if somebody like really kind of does their best to cover up something to a manner that someone's due diligence wouldn't find it so they could push a sale... What is the con... So, as it relates to houses, I'm sure there's regulation out there that the state has to protect the consumer, okay? So when there's mold in homes sold by Lennar, there's probably some reason other than corporate goodwill why they have to fix it, Right. okay? And they themselves make certain warranties about their product, okay? A warranty, insurance. a warranty is a representation of standing behind a particular product, okay? Right. So I'm talking to that in a commercial transaction what representations, right, what reps and warranties is the seller making to you? And the only thing that's going to govern in a commercial transaction is what's in writing. If it's not in writing, you can assume, you can assume that it hasn't, um, um, uh, that it's going to have no value later on. There's no lemon law that's going to protect you, okay? Um, when you look at your capital structure, I mentioned debt. I left out a whole equity component. Uh, but you know, you're going to want to understand if there's assumable debt. You're going to want to understand the terms and conditions of that debt. 
you're going to want to understand the cost associated with that assumption, whether it's yours or the seller's, okay, and what the timing is involved. Um, I tried to, I had an assumable loan once and we wound up having, having to do fees because the assumption process was just taking forever. We could not get a special servicer to approve it. It got to the point where we were running out of time. We had a 1031, we had a window where we had to close and like we could defeat a loan, but we just could not assume it in time. They kept asking questions about our corporate structure. They weren't interested, they really weren't interested in approving it. Okay? So you need to understand the timing involved is you need to understand what covenants you may be walking into, all right? And you need to understand what kind of deposits might be required of you that become transaction items in a closing statement, okay? Or items that you're going to have to, I know it's almost time to go, but it's not quite, okay? It's not quite, okay? And whether it's, and if it's a new loan, you're gonna have the same sort of issues, okay? So, uh, no. we haven't finished this. We haven't finished this, I've got one more slide, and then, and then that translates to how does it all really work? So, here's what we're gonna do because I can think while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Um, um, next week, we're going to have a quiz on this. I want to finish it. I want to have a quiz on this. The quiz is already done, but there's no sense giving it to you because there's still material that needs to be done. And I'm not, I don't want to keep you here longer than um, So we're going to have a quiz on this. I, I believe we might be able to have a quiz on this and what we're going to cover next week. But we might have two quizzes next week. If, if we don't have two quizzes next week, no, if we don't have two quizzes next week, what's going to happen is, is this quiz is going to count for this week and next week. So it's going to count, count double. Okay. Now, um, what we were going to do in class today, I'm going to give you the assignment in a piece of paper. Um, and, and it's based on the video. And so you know, you're know you going to have more time to do it. Um, but I, I, I need it back by Monday evening. Okay. Pretty simple. I'm going to give it to you. And so that will be this week's in class assignment. I'll do a couple more videos for next week. And we'll, uh, and we'll finish this. Because I think this is, I hope you found this stuff interesting. That was a lot of information. This used to be a whole course. <laughs> well, please get some rest and then take care yes, of your pneumonia. Yes, I, I, yes it, thank you for uh, being concerned about you. No, I mean, there's a serious question. No, 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 or else we wouldn't be able to get all those great videos. <laughs> so before you leave, don't take the quiz because... No, 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 no. Yes. Uh, Thanks, Is there class Probably. Yeah. I don't know, honestly. I assume so. Yeah. Yeah, me, me too. Nah. I just I'll give you this. One. One. I didn't even That's think enough. about it. That's enough. <laughs>